Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just let me tell you something about myself. From my accent, you will notice I'm a... I come originally from the United Kingdom. I've been living in Israel now for 35 years. The accent still <coughs> remains an accent. And uh, I'm very happy to be here and to meet Rabbi Mizrahi again after many years. And understanding that there are a lot of singles here this evening, uh, this talk uh, of the challenges of a contemporary marriage, I think, would be very appropriate. <coughs> um, <coughs> you know, I sometimes wonder, when you look at statistics, I sometimes wonder why people still want to get married. Because statistics are horrifying. In this wonderful country over here, among the Jewish population, the divorce rate is 67%. <coughs> and I can tell you that we're up from where I come from, which is no different, Israel being just another democratic society of the Western world, the divorce rate in the first year of marriage is 32% which is, a, it's in the first year of marriage. I thought Jews were good investors. To spend sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 on a marriage and the chance that that investment will last one year, I don't think it's a pretty good investment. I think you'll make more on the NASDAQ, believe me. But people still want to do it. And it's this issue I want to talk about tonight. Because I feel that there's something wrong with the system. Something basically wrong with the system. I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to get down to it. Two people, sometimes from different cultures, different countries, meet each other, date each other, and they decide that they're going to live with each other for the next 90 years. How does that system work? Because before we look at the system of two people getting married, let's have a look at two individuals. These two as individuals. As two individuals, let's ask ourselves the question. We're not talking about marriage now, we're talking about people, human beings, not, just, not Jews even. Just human beings. We're all born one day in history. Being that we're born one day in history, we've landed on planet Earth. Hopefully every one of us feels that he will be blessed with a 120 year tourist visa on this planet. But one day that tourist visa is going to come to a grinding halt. We know where that ends up. What is the most important concept in any individual's life? The central focal point of that person's life which makes his life or her life meaningful? One word. The self. Me. I am the most important concept in my life. Everything surrounds that self. During this 120 year tourist visa, the self wants to achieve something in life. He wants a career, family, love and respect, health, success, see the world, enjoy the world. All these wonderful things people are looking for in life. I know more than anybody else, we're all like this. Do you agree with me for the time being? And if a person achieves all this, it's what we call happiness. That's what we want to be. We all want to be happy. It's, imagine a circle with a self at the center. And in that circle, all these things zero in onto a person. It's what you call self 
fulfillment. That's what we all search for. All the things we do in life are things which give the self a feeling of satisfaction. The music I listen to is music that I like. I do not listen to music which I don't like. Certainly the music that you listen to might not be the type of music I would listen to. The music I listen to won't be the music that you listen to. The hobbies that each person has are hobbies which he likes. Are there any chess players among us over here? Chess players? No? Ah, oh, we've got a chess player at the back. Do you collect stamps too? No? Why not? It's an interesting hobby. Because it doesn't interest you. It doesn't talk to you. It's not meaningful to you. It'll give you no satisfaction. Okay? The sports that we play, the games that we play, are the games which we like. Some people enjoy golf, others tennis, another one basketball, the other one football, soccer, whichever it is. That which a person gets an element of satisfaction out, that it becomes meaningful to him. The person then is self-centered. It's the center of that central focal point of a person. Now it sounds negative, but it's not necessarily negative. Even people who are do-gooders, even people who do good to others, do it because they feel good. The self gets a certain satisfaction out of doing good. I met a young man many years ago in a particular country in the world. A nice Jewish boy, his name was Rafi, who gave up five years of his life to work with one of the United Nations health groups in Ethiopia, Mozambique. Countries where kids are di dying of starvation. For four or five years to live with mosquitoes. It was tough. And I asked him, Rafi, what did you, why did you do it? Five years of your life to give up living in some mosquito-ridden country? He says, because I feel good when I help others. So even when a person is a do-gooder, the ulterior motive, the motive, the true motive is what? Self-satisfaction. Believe me, if there would be another couple of hundred million Rafis in the world, this planet would look a different place. But this is what it's all about. This is human nature. Now let's imagine two people, two circles, two selves, two people want to achieve self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment. They come together. Somehow they love each other. And they want to be with one another. Can you tell me what will forge what is the chemistry that could forge two selves with two ideas of what they want in life and produce a unit which will continue for the next 70, 80 years? A journey of 80 years. If I would ask people, tell me, why do you want to get married? I'll hear answers, I want a family. I want to love someone, I feel lonely without a spouse, I need a partner in my life, I have physical needs to be fulfilled. Did you notice what was a common denominator of all those statements, of which I think all of them are right, that's basically why people do get married. What's the common denominator of all those statements I have now made? Aye. That's it. And the other side has exactly the same, makes the same statements. How do you forge something living together? Do you know what happens then? It happens that the spouse of a person is not a subject, but is an object. 
I remember many years ago, I won't tell you how many, you'll know how old I am, but um, when I was studying in Yeshiva in England, our teachers, our mentors used to give us talks preparing us for, for marriage and taking it seriously. And I remember my Rebbe with a big, long, white beard. I remember him saying to this, tell me, what is the difference between these two statements? I love fish and chips. I love my wife. It's almost the same statement. I'm crazy over my wife. I'm crazy over fish and chips. Fish and chips is a British delicatessen, what it what used to be, I don't know whether it is now. Anyway, what is the difference between I love fish and chips and I love my wife? And obviously we were sat over there with, what's he talking about? He said, I want to tell you something. Absolutely no difference. Now, have you ever seen somebody stand under a chuppah with a bag of fish and chips <laughs> and say, Hari at <laughs> What? What does that mean? What, 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 what mean? Oh, okay. oh, what I just now said in Hebrew. Oh, the, these are the words a person, a, a groom, says to his bride under, under the chuppah, under the chuppah, and he says, you are betrothed to me according to the laws of Moses and Israel. He gives her a ring, and those are the words he says. Fine, that's fair enough. So he said, have you ever seen somebody stand with a packet of fish and chips and say the same words? Obviously not. But you use the same language. So what does he mean? Can, so nobody's ever fallen in love with fish and chips, or falafel, or, or pizza. Okay, today, modern, today's modern. I love pizza. So what does I love pizza mean? You know what I love me pizza means? It means this. I love myself. One of the objects which gives that self-satisfaction and self-love a certain sense of fulfillment is pizza, or fish and chips, or falafel, whatever it is. Okay? That's what it means. Exactly the same thing means when a person is talking about a wife. A wife or a husband. And when the wife looks at the husband, the husband of the wife, I'm just I'm to, being, a, being a man, I'm speaking from my point of view. Means that when I say I love my wife, my wife is an object of self-love. I love myself. One of the objects that I use to reach feeling of self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment, is that human being opposite me. She says she means it about him, he means it about her. Do you know what happens then? It means that two people are not living one life. Two people are living parallel lives. They live parallel lives at the expense of one another. Now what happens, I'm going to be, I'm going to be tough this evening, you see, because I'm leaving the country soon, my, ex, my deportation papers have come through, so nothing to worry about. <laughs> Tell me, how many pizzas can a person eat in a week, as much as you love pizza? Come on, let's put our cards on the table. How many pizzas can you eat until it's coming out of your ears? What happens when you've ate 35 pizzas, 50 pizzas, 125 pizzas? Do you know what happens? You get sick and tired of pizza. I don't want to have to tell you exactly what I mean, but you know as well as I do. The same thing can happen to a wife, the same thing can happen to a husband. The more it is something which you say, it's an old, it's, I don't know if it's a proverb or it's a statement. Familiarity breeds contempt. You have too much of something, then you have contempt. And when you have contempt, you know what happens? You get fed up. 
So either you walk out, or if you're burnt out, then you look for new kicks. That is a truth of the world we live in. Now you can understand why marriages don't last that long. It's a tragedy. This is the way we live our lives. We live our lives for ourselves. We live in a very selfish world. We live in a very aggressive world. Where to be successful, you have to fight for yourself. The more you are successful, the self of that person goes on an ego trip. He becomes even more selfish and it just snowballs through a person's life. It's all for yourself. I remember when I left school, in this country graduation is a, is a very ceremonious day. Where I came from, from the United Kingdom, there, there was not such thing as graduation. You left school, you left school, finished, last day that was it. But I remember when I finished school, the last day at school, the principal of the school took us into the lecture room to all the school leavers. And he said to us these words, I remember it till this very day. He says, I want you, you young men to know one thing. Till this day, the government has paid for your education, for your uniforms, your textbooks, even your pencils was paid for by the government in those days. Things have changed since. Everything was paid for. I want you to know, the day you walk out of the gates of this school and never come back again, which will be in a few hours' time, you're walking into the Wild West. You're walking into, I remember how he described it, John Wayne country. Gunslingers. It's a tough world. It's an aggressive world. And if you want to be successful, you've got to be tough, you've got to be aggressive. Well, I come from in Israel, and there are, I take it, some Israelis among us here. If you ask them, tell me, what do you need to be successful in this world today? Money? A Rolex watch? No. You know what you need to be successful? Elbows. Elbows. You know what elbows are? In Hebrew, ma'pikim. You know what elbows are? Elbows is this. Push everybody aside and climb the ladder of success. And this is what we call legitimate competition. It's a tough world out there. The competition within the business world. In every, in every area. So if you want to be successful, if you're going to think of others you're going to remain one big nobody. Think of yourself, climb that ladder of success, it's tough. Okay? And now we're going to translate this into a partnership between two people. Do you see where we're going? What are the chances such a thing will be a success? Now, I want you to understand, and I should have premised my talk with these words. To understand, we're talking about human beings. You cannot generalize about human beings, except for the very fact that we all breathe the same oxygen, the things of laws of nature. But certainly there are people who might be very selfish, but have stuck out a marriage of 80 years. So you'll say, you bring as an example, of course there will be some. I have to talk in general guidelines, general terms. Looking at the world that we live in, I've sat in, although myself, personally, I'm not a marriage counsellor, but I have sat in to taking a side view of a marriage counsellor counselling young couples with their problems. And you can see, as you go from one problem to the next, one family, one young couple, the next young couple, the third young couple, the common denominator is exactly what we're talking about. That what? I expect from him something. He says, yeah, I know, but I expect it from her something. Everybody expects from the other. Nobody expects from themselves. 
This is a common denominator. And this is so destructive that no wonder marriages end up in divorce. Even sometimes in the very first year of marriage, even though that they stood under the chuppah, and most probably they said, it will never happen to us. We love each other. It will never happen to us. But it does. So now, ladies and gentlemen, before I come back to this issue, I want to present to you what is a Torah viewpoint? What is a Jewish viewpoint on this wonderful, wonderful uh, establishment in the, in, the, in the human world, the Jewish world, called marriage, which is so central, it's so important, first of all, for the survival of the Jewish people. In 1984, Professor Lord William Rees Mogg one of the world's top economists wrote a book on the economy and uh, nobody except a student of economics would read that book but that book came to my knowledge because of uh, how he uses Judaism he has a chapter on Judaism chapter one to use it as an analogy for world global market problems you'd wonder what Judaism has got to do with that but the idea was excellent and I'm just going to quote to you one statement that he makes. In a time of survival, we have to ask the question, how did the Jewish people survive? Not just as a spiritual or as a physical nation. No doubt, they have survived because of the strength of the family. We he knew this, I had no idea. I mean, Professor Lord William Rees Mogg, who is today the editor of the London Financial Times, he was the dean of the London School of Economics. Um, where he knew this, I have no idea. But he's right. Now, if it is a Jewish family that is the chemistry of the survival of the Jewish people, then I can say one thing. My hopes for the survival of the Jewish people are not as strong as they used to be. When we, as I say, when we saw the statistics that we've seen. What does Judaism say? Okay, so you know what we're going to do? This is a basic, this is you have to give me credit that I know what I'm talking about. To me, the Bible, the Torah, is the ultimate truth. It's a God-given truth. It is an eternal truth. It is a timeless truth. And everything that's in Torah is not history, but there's a lesson to be learnt us today in our day and age from every single word, every single letter that Torah teaches us. If you have any questions about this, if you have a problem about the divinity of Torah, join us tomorrow afternoon at that weekend seminar, which we'll be doing at the Ontario Airport Hotel. And boy, you will get, it'll be an eye-opener to show how we can prove the truth of Judaism, rationally. Okay. So we're going to go back to the first marriage in the history of humanity. And we're going to read a few words, which hopefully will give us an insight into what life is all about. The first marriage is Adam and Eve. Adam and Chava. Two people. They were humanity themselves. They weren't just the young couple. They were humanity. A very successful marriage. I know people, I know all the jokes. The reason why it was successful because there was no mother-in-law involved on both sides of the family. <laughs> we know all about it. We know the jokes. But let us now read a verse which I think is grossly mistranslated. It's a very famous verse. When Adam was created, the male was created, the Torah says these words. And God said, Is anybody willing to translate those words? Leave, forget about the word Eze Kenegdo, the very first words. Lotov Heyot Ha'adam Levado. 
It is not good for man to be alone. I will give him a helper opposite him. That is the way it is translated. Grossly mistranslated. Because if it was to mean it is not good for man to be alone, the word should be lotov le'adam lihiyot levav. In Hebrew, lotov, excuse me, lotov le'adam lihiyot levav, it is not good for man to be alone. Le Adam to be alone. Correct? Is that the way it should be translated? But what does it say? It says the word Lotov. Stop. Heyot ha Adam Levado. Because man is alone. It doesn't say it's not good for man to be alone. It says Lotov. It is not good. Comma. Heyot ha Adam Levado. Because man is alone. Suggesting something else is not good. It's not that it's not good for man, but something else is no good. That's what it says, correct? Says Rabbi Samson of Fall Hirsch. That that is the true translation. So what is no good? What is no good because man is alone? Now we have a principle. Any person who studies Torah, there's a principle in understanding the Hebrew language. Any time a word is used for the first time in the Bible, the meaning of the word as it appears the first time will be identical meaning right through the Bible. So where do we find the word tov the first time? Well, it's in chapter 1, verse 3. Vayome Elohim yehi or, and God said, let there be light. Vayehi or, and there was light. Verse 3. Vayome and Vayar Elohim kitov. And God saw it was good. What does it mean, and God saw it was good? Well, obviously, it didn't mean that some booming voice came out into the macrocosmos saying, wow, what a beautiful light I created. Yeah? It doesn't mean that. So, what does it mean? The word tov means it can play its part in the purpose of creation. The first day was good. The second day was good. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Every day was good. Put it all together. Now it will be very good. In chapter 2, where we're discussing the creation of man, Vayome Elohim and God said, Lo tov, there is no purpose to creation. Why? Heyot ha'adam levato. He's alone. Eselo eze kenegdo. I will make him a helper opposite him. The other part, together, they produce the purpose of creation. It's not one is playing first violin. And the second one is second violin. They're both playing first violin. Both together, they produce one purpose. In other words, if we are going to have a look and see what is the purpose of man in life, and then bring two people together who share the identical goals. Now we can forge chemistry between them. It's not two circles with two selves. It becomes now one circle with an us. If it is a one circle with an us, a we, striving for the same goals together, Depending on one another, it's not now becoming objects of one another, but we are subjects of one another. A totally different ballgame. This is what our Torah says. It goes one stage further. 
Several verses later it says these words. Zacha una keva bara otam. He created them as male and female. Vayavarechotam. And he blessed them. Vayikra et shmam adam. And he called their name Adam. Not his name or her name, but their name Adam. My goodness, what a blessing. That, that's a real blessing. Giving them a name. A blessing is nachas, wealth, health, wisdom. That's a blessing. So what was a blessing over here where he gave them a name and he called it Adam? What's the blessing in the word Adam? Do you know what it is? Well, for this again, we have to learn a little bit of the language. How many words in Hebrew represent the Homo sapiens, the, the human being? How do you call a man in Hebrew? Ish. How do you call a woman? Sha. Are there any other words which describe a male, a man? Gever. How do you describe a woman? Gvira. No, Gvira is the Tanakhic word. Yes, okay, it's the same word. Is there another word for man? Enosh. Ashrei enosh ya'asezot. And you have a word, Adam is also a man. Of all these words, one word is the exception to a rule. And the word is Adam. Do you know why? All the other words have plurals to it. Ish, Anashim. Isha, Nashim. Gever, Gvarim. Gvira, Gvirot. Enosh, no? Enosh? Anoshim. Sometimes it's Anushim and sometimes an Anashim. There is no such word of Adamim. There is no plural of the word Adam. There is no plural of that word. That was the blessing. Producing two people into a single unit which you cannot pluralize. That was the blessing. But when, not when two people live parallel lives, self-fulfillment at the expense of the other, but one purpose, putting both of them together. Not, it, it does not reduce the selves what they want. It doesn't say that Let's say he has a career, she has a career. She has her ideas of what she would like to see the world, he would like, she'd like to see the Far East. He says, Far East doesn't interest me, I love to see Argentina. It does not change that. What it does change is this. Each and every one has to ask, what is my purpose in life? And not only what is my purpose, but the other things are no longer purposes anymore. They're no longer goals. The self was a goal till now. The self is no longer a goal. The self is now an instrument to a higher goal. That higher goal is a spirituality which Torah teaches us. When both of them have that in mind, then each and every one's means to the ends do not contradict one another, they actually can complement one another. This is what marriage is all about. And for this reason, we need something to forge that chemistry. How do you forge the chemistry? Two people, they have the same goals, the same ideas, but how do you forge that chemistry that brings these two circles that they will now complement one another? One word. It's called love. That is the chemistry which forges two people coming together. And now we have to define this word. What is love? What does love mean? I love my wife. Don't forget, I love pizza too. So. 
What does it mean? What does I love my wife? What does that mean? Now, I, 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 the question over here actually is this. In fact, you've just now mentioned that point, which I'm going to talk about. You know what I sometimes call this co- talk? I call this talk, love is giving, or giving is love. Now, it's based, I give this name, it's based on a famous musical in your wonderful country. Those of you who remember the 60s, where most of you don't. Some of you weren't even born then. It was history. But you remember in those years of the 60s and the early 70s, musicals were very popular, very popular films, Rodgers and Hammerstein and uh, others. It was a famous romantic musical called Love is a Many Splendid Thing. The theme song was the theme song was the theme of the name of the film. And you know what it says? Part of the lyrics says these words. Love is giving the reason for living. It's one of the lines of the lyrics of that, of that song. This is pure Hollywood style. Because we're going to find that this is, not, this is wrong. <coughs> Tell me, is it easy to give? Is the world that we live in today... Is it a world which tells you to be selfless? Or is it a world which tells you to be selfish? We are, we are living in a world which trains us to selfishness. As I said, be successful, you make it, nobody's going to help you, you've got to do it yourself, think of yourself, that's it. That's the world we live in. And then I remember, I like using this analogy, it's an analogy. I remember I was once on a flight with uh, British Airways. I was flying to Australia. It's a long flight. It's 30 hours to get there. To get to Australia. I remember sitting in the plane and one of the first things everybody does when he gets into a plane and sits down, he takes out the in-flight magazine, see if there's anything to read. I never usually can read anything that. But once I did read something, it was interesting, and that was British Airways, I had an article about how British Airways train their flight attendants. It's a 15 months course. The first three months, they claim, our flight attendants are trained to become almost robots when it comes to safety on board an aircraft. That is part one before anything else. Hijackings, emergency landings, turbulence, what they're supposed to do under every imaginable circumstance of safety on board an aircraft. In fact, they claim that all their lady flight attendants are all trained in basic in basic gynecology if a woman will give birth on an aircraft. They even have to be trained for something like that too. Um, that was the first three months. The next 12 months, they need training to a mentality. The mentality is the passenger is always right. Do you hear that? The passenger is always right. British Airways prides itself that its flight attendants never lose their tempers twice. What does that mean? If you lose your temper once, you're fired, you can work for American Airlines, but not for British Airways. Hmm? And they have to smile, and they have to be outgoing, and they have to give, never get angry, always have a nice smile on your faces, so you can imagine the situations, and I fly a lot. I have a lot of mileage. And I know how sometimes you can sit there and watch how a flight attendant walks by and somebody will ask her, excuse me, could I have a Diet Coke, please? She says, yes, sir. She'll walk a half a mile down the plane, come back three, four minutes later with a tray and a Diet Coke. As she arrives at that seat, the next door neighbor says, could I have a Diet Coke, please? Now, Max Perry, what's going through her mind is this. 
You stupid idiot. You could have also asked at the same time and have bought two diet jokes, two diet cokes. Now I have to walk another half a mile down the plane and bring another diet coke. Yes, of course, sir. Of course I'll bring you a diet coke. She comes back. Then the lady asks her, could you warm up this bottle of Materna? You know, uh, just baby food. Just heat it up for me. She must be blowing her mind already. She's all smiles. <laughs> yes, of course. It's wonderful. Where did you get that training from? They told them once the story, I once read about it in the Reader's Digest, of a stewardess who was walking down the aisle with a galley, handing out the meals, taking out the trays and putting them on people's tables. The meals. And there were two little kids running up and down the aisle, Johnny and Jimmy, running up and down, and she wanted to kill them already. Yeah. But you've got, you mustn't get angry. Yeah. So she says, Johnny, Jimmy, could you come over here? I said, yes. Would you like to go and play outside? <laughs> At 39,000 feet. No, please sit down. Please sit down. But isn't that wonderful? There was a smile on the face. You want to murder the kids, right? To be outgoing, to be giving yourself. Now, we all know this is, it's all money. It's, it's all, it's all commercialized. But a person needs training. To be able to be that type of person. The other person is always right. I have to give off every bit of myself to that person. Where do you have a training program for two people going on a flight together? And it, believe me, it's more than 30 hours. I mean, some marriages don't last more than that. But uh, a long haul flight of 80 years. And each to every one says the passenger is always right. Where she is the passenger, where he is her passenger. Where do you get that type of concept, a training program of forgetting about yourself and giving over to others? I had an incident many years ago also where I was having a chat, it was in Tel Aviv, Listen to this. I was having a chat with a, uh, an Israeli basketball player. I don't want to mention names. He was quite famous. <laughs> Won't mention any names. Let's call him Moishi. That's his name. Okay? That was not his name. Um, I said, Moishi, do you mind? I'd like to present to you with a scenario. A scenario of a moral dilemma. He says, okay. Now, when I spoke to him then, it was a time that in Israel they still only had one television channel. Once they had a, one television, that's going back 25, nearly 30 years. They had one television channel, but if you had a special antenna, you could actually pick up Jordanian television or Cyprus television. You could pick up another channel outside with a special antenna. Now, he's a basketball player. The scenario goes like this. On Wednesday nights at 8.30, at 8.30, there's basketball on TV. But if you watch Jordanian television, there is an orchestral concert being coming out of England or Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra. Okay? Your wife loves classical music. You love basketball. Now, you come back home at six in the evening from work, and you tell your wife, Hanale, I've had a day at the office, the worst day in my life. You know there are certain days in one's life, you call them black days. Everything goes wrong. The starter motor got stuck, right? You had a flat tire. You had a meeting. You missed the meeting because you got stuck in a traffic jam. Um, the tax people had come in to check your books. The secretary was off. She had bronchitis that day. Right? The computers were down. You know, you have one of those days, in Yiddish they call it a schwarze tog, a real black day. Everything goes wrong. His blood sugar level is going through the ceiling. His blood pressure is going through the ceiling. He is absolutely uptight. He's had a terrible day. And he says, look, Hanale, if you don't want me to have a nervous breakdown, if you don't want me to have a nervous breakdown, yeah, if tonight I can watch basketball at 8.30 for a few moments, yeah, for one and a half hours, at least I'll be a mensch, I'll be somebody. If not, I'm going to burst at the seams. 
And she says, Moshele. She said, and what the day do you think I had at home? And what type of day do you think I had at home? I put a cake in the oven and I put clothing in the washing machine. I thought the washing cycle had com completed. I didn't know. I opened the door, 20 gallons of water came out. The, the, the motor stopped in the middle of the cycle. So till I, got, till I started getting the water out of the lounge and out of the kitchen, the flood suddenly, Gaval! The cake is burning. She had to use a fire extinguisher. The cake was on fire. Do you know, I also look, you're out there, you're meeting people. I'm here in a prison, <coughs> I'm in the house, trying to make you happy. And our little baby did something on the carpet, which in the, in the lounge, which I again had to clean up, took me three quarters of an hour to clean up. Please, Moshe, understand me. At least you're out there, you're talking to people. Believe me, if I can listen to, <coughs> if I can listen to an orchestral concert for one and a half hours, at least I can switch off a little bit. <coughs> okay? So I said to this guy, this is exactly how it went. I said to him, tell me, what do you do? What do you do? You want to watch basketball and you need it. It's one of the needs that you have. She wants to watch an orchestral concert. She needs it. So what do you do? Do you know what he said to me? He said to me, who told you? I said, what do you mean, who told me? Who told me what? Who, who told you this scenario? I said, I just made it up. I just made it up for your entertainment in order to... He said, Rabbi, this happened to me last week. Almost the same idea. Basically the same. I happened last week. So I said, well, till now I thought it was a hypothetical situation. Now I realize it's a practical situation. Yeah. What did you do? What do you do? How do you solve the problem? She says, I went out and bought another television. <laughs> and you think I didn't know that's what we were, uh, his answer would be? Go out and buy another television. See what happens? I said, Moishi, if you stay married for the next two years, five years of marriage, it'll be a miracle. Come and tell me about it. Your marriage is doomed to failure. How did, you, how did you solve the problem? You didn't. The problem's still there. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. The problem's still there. You will not concede. She won't concede. It's not even compromise. Compromise is meeting the middle somewhere. I want what I want. You want what you want. So what do you expect? In the end, it'll be one incident, a second incident, a third incident, and then it gets more uh, acute, these incidences, and they say, you know what, let's call it a day. Enough is enough, in the words of George W. Bush. Yeah. That's what happens. That's love. Oh, and I love her. I, oh, she's wonderful, she's wonderful. That's right, until she treads on my toe. Or until I tread on her toe, we love each other. We're living in a dream world, it just doesn't last. And that's why I say to people, that's why I say to people, believe you me, in our day and age, I have no idea why people still want to get married. I remember an incident when I spank to 30 young ladies. 30 young ladies. And I told them, I'm going now to stop talking for the next 30 seconds on my watch. I want you all to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine you have married your dream husband. I stopped for 30 seconds. Perf deathly silence. They'd close their eyes and you could see the smiles on their faces. <laughs> Some of them blushing a little bit. Yeah, but it was wonderful just to watch the situation. After 30 seconds, I said, now, I want you all to imagine you are now three months after marriage. Your husband comes back from work every day, 5.30. You've got two candles on the table. Curtains are closed. They're going to have a romantic supper. Candlelight. He sees your shadow, and you see his shadow. And so romantic. 
only three months after marriage. And the situation is this, that your husband hasn't yet come home. It's already seven o'clock in the evening. What is the first thought that goes through your mind? He's one and a half hours late. What's the first thought that goes through your mind? You ought to have seen their faces. One's going, until one young lady said to me, said, no, Rabbi, I would not be thinking what you think I will be thinking about. I said, maybe, young lady, fine. What about the other 29 young ladies? Sure, what's going on? They admit that the very first thought that's going through their mind, it's not that he's late at the office, it's not that, God forbid, he's involved in a road accident or in a massive traffic jam because of a road accident. The first thought that goes through their minds, they admit it to me three months after marriage, that there's another woman in the picture. That's what they were saying. And they admitted it. So I said to them, if that's the case, kids, don't get married. It's just not worth paying that price. Remain single for the rest of your life. The tensions that you will be living with, they're just not worth it. This is the world that we live in. This is the world that we live in. This is our problem. Buy two televisions, train yourself to give up yourself as if you don't exist and only the passenger exists, your spouse. This, ladies and gentlemen, is something which we have to train ourselves. But you see, we make the mistake about this whole concept of what love is. How many of us, I want to say in this room, how many of us dream of the day of this situation of love at first sight? You know, it's the, it's the Hollywood type of scenario where the young man gets onto the bus, he pays for his ticket, he's walking down to find a seat, Suddenly his eyes zero in on somebody and a certain energy radiates between their eyes and something clicked. It clicked. And now we've got to make the meeting. So she'll drop her purse, he'll walk past, pick it up, say, hi, here's your purse. Oh, thank you very much. Well, at last they're talking, right? And then that's it. That's two in the afternoon. By four in the afternoon they are sitting in a, uh, a restaurant having coffee and a coffee and cake. <laughs> He'll be taking her out to dinner at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And uh, by 10 o'clock at night, you, you know where they are. I'm sitting in front of a synagogue. I don't want to have to say where it is, right? Mm. Yeah. That's it. That's it. This, is it. this is love at first sight. This is what you call love at first sight. I've never I've understood what this love at first sight. And then you know what? And at the end of the film, they walk out, arm in arm, into the sunset. The camera moves away from them, and they lived happily ever after for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and the only truth about that film are the two words which appear on the screen, the end. <laughs> this is what it's all about. I've always wondered, how, what do you mean? That she doesn't even know who he is. He doesn't know who she is. He could be a, a serial killer looking for the next victim. You know? <laughs> yeah. Radiates, something radiates. What is it that radiates over there? <coughs> well, that's not called love. That's called infatuation. Infatuation. It's all infatuation. It's nothing more. If you want really to know how to translate this into simple English, it is pure biology and physiology. Nothing more than that. It cannot be more than that. And as I say, if everything is based on physiology, then you get burnt out very quickly. Familiarity breeds contempt. Love is something else. The Hebrew word for love is ahava. 
The root of the word Ahava is the word Hav. The two central letters. Ahava is Hav. The two central letters. Hav means to be a giver. It is, you see, what happens is that Hollywood understands love, you love a person, then you want to give to that person. You want to share with that person. Love is giving. The reason for living, that's the song. Love is a many splendid thing. So they feel that you love, fall in love with a person, and then you want to share with that person. Well, it isn't. It's wrong. Giving produces the love. Not love produces the giving. Giving produces the love. Because it is human nature. Do you know why? In human nature, anything that you invest in, if there's a, let's say there's a person in this room, a carpenter, and he's just now been working on producing, somebody ordered, somebody ordered a table. I wanted that table to be almost hand carved. And he's an expert in this. And he's going to work two months on it. He finishes that table. He looks at it. He's in love with his own, with the, the fruit of his hands, isn't he? You know why? Because something you invest in, there's a part of you there. And just because you love yourself, now is the positive aspect of self-love, is because you love yourself, you will love anything where there's a part of you there. In other words, when you invest into something, then, and only then, you are loving that something. This is, this is human nature. We love our children. Why do we love our children? And we don't love the next door neighbor's children. Because it's my flesh and blood. Because I've given of myself to that person. It's not only I produced him, because I am now investing in that child from day one, feeding and clothing, educating, playing with. There's a part of me there, and because I love myself, I will love anything where the I am there is a part of me. And you can imagine two neighbors, each one's got three boys. The first neighbor's got three sons, they're three gangsters. John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and Al, and Al Capone. You can imagine. Three of the Chicago gangsters of the 30s. The next door neighbor's got three angels. Angel Michael, Angel Gabriel, and, and Angel Raphael. Right? Now, obviously, the first, the first neighbor with the three gangsters would like to have three angels. But who does he love? He loves his three gangster sons. Why? They're mine. I'll never forget, I can never forget this. In Israel, when Yigal Amir was found guilty of killing Yitzhak Rabin and was sentenced to life imprisonment, his mother came out of the courtroom and an interviewer of one of the Israeli radio programs stuck the microphone, you know how they get into her mouth, and asked her a question. Listen to the question. Now that it has been proven that your son killed the Prime Minister, can you still love him? That was a question. And she answered, my son did a very cruel and wicked thing. But he's my son. You can't get escape from that. He's my son. Now, when I heard the interviewer's question, it didn't interest me what her answer would be. But I was wondering, how can an interviewer even ask such a question? What do you mean? Because her son had committed a crime, it's not her son? All I can tell you is I have no idea who the interviewer was. One thing I can tell you. Either she's been divorced 17 times, or she's never ever got married, or she's just a greedy, selfish, self-centered 